Good morning, good evening. Good ever afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. I'm not Ira, I'm Dave Armstrong. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am a principal engineer at Advantest. And Ira is a little under the weather today. He, he has logged in, but he's asked me to uh, coordinate and drive the session. Um, I'm also a member of the board of directors of MEPTECH. So this is the next uh, presentation in our speaker series on the semiconductor industry. And we're very fortunate today to have uh, uh, Mark Taranapur from University of Florida speaking on security AI issues. So before we get to Mark, let me remind everyone that in about in two weeks, we have another speaker in this series planned, uh, Don Kai Shangun, something like that. Speaking of machine learning, artificial intelligence, a critical enabler for advanced semiconductor packages and electronic manufacturing. Clearly, a lot of us see how AI can help us do our jobs better. And uh, not only is it critical for security, but also for actually our manufacturing. Next week, we have our Road to Chiplets. This is a multi-day conference. It's actually a pretty exciting conference. I've been on the planning committee for this, and we have some great speakers lined up, some great talks. Um, Chiplets is going is revolutionizing the industry, and how to how to use the data from the chiplets, some of the secure data that the professors are going to be talking about today, and how to test them is certainly not easy. I would remind you that MEPTECH organization does have sponsorships and memberships available. Uh, if you're interested in joining or sponsoring, please be sure to reach out to Betty Cooper. So let me introduce secure heterogeneous integration and packaging. Boy, is that uh, possible? Let's hope so. So our speaker today is Mark Taranapur from University of Florida. Mark is the, the endowed chair in the cybersecurity group or uh, focusing on cybersecurity in the ECE department, at the University of Florida. Um, his research interests include IoT security, hardware security and trust, supply chain risk management and security, counterfeit electronic det detection and prevention, and reliable circuit design. Notably, I mean, he's hardware focused. How do we make our hardware unpenetratable? He has a long list of accomplishments as well as various awards and, uh, and uh, honors from the industry. And so with no further ado, ado, I'd like to pass baton over to Mark to share his presentation. Uh, let me first uh, um, start by thanking Ira for uh, inviting me to uh, give a presentation on a topic that is uh, growing quite a bit in my team and in the institute that I'm the director of. And uh, I think um, it's, a, it's an important topic, needs a lot of attention, especially as we put uh, pieces in place when it comes to heterogeneous integration and packaging. And uh, thanks, Dave, for the kind intro. So with that, um, I'll start. I have plenty of materials to cover and uh, feel free to ask me questions during, during the presentation. Um, happy to make this uh, more interactive. Uh, as Dave said, the topic is uh, focused very much on security aspect of heterogeneous integration and life, um, and life cycle assurance. Um, I'm currently the director of Florida Institute for Cybersecurity Research. Um, I've also um, um, I'm the found, one of the founders of a, of a startup called Caspio Technologies. And there's actually a parallel activity within the company as well with focus on uh, developing solutions um, that could be used for um, uh, security during integration, as well as establishing lifecycle assurance for heterogeneous uh, integration and advanced packaging, etc. cetera. Um, so that, I divided my talk into um, a few sections, um, but it's really two major categories. One is uh, hardware security fundamentals, 
which I'll be talking a little bit about um, what are the security issues that we have to be concerned about during the uh, design, fabrication, et cetera. And you could see that there's a lot of similarities between what uh, we have been dealing with in the microelectronic security, the way the SOCs are designed, the way the chips are designed and the way the supply chain look like. And, and as we move toward heterogeneous integration, those similarities can come in place, but there's also a unique set of challenges that we'll be talking during this uh, presentation. So when it comes to security um, of microelectronics, one important thing that um, I always teach my students is to understand supply chain. And if you look at any supply chain, whether it's electronic supply chain or pharmaceutical supply chain or, or, or uh, uh, food supply chain, you always start with some kind of a design and then planning and then execution, delivery, and then sustaining it during the process being used or, or consumed and then end of life. And if you look at um, electronic supply chain is, no, is, is, is not an exception. It basically follows the same rule that there's design, there's fabrication, assembly test, um, distribution in the field, goes through lifetime and then end of life, right? So at a high level, you know, that's what the supply chain look like. But the reality is that um, once you dig deeper, you see that there is a lot of different entities involved in the supply chain, especially that we moved from a more vertical approach to semiconductor design, fabrication, test, et cetera, to a more horizontal approach and globally distributed where these entities that you see here, um, they all may be involved in the electronic supply chain, but they're all placed at different, different locations across the globe in a device starting from IP can roam around various entities and various sometimes continents, and then get to become the chip, chip become the system, system become system of systems, and then from there goes into the application and from application it goes to toward end of life. And even end of life, there are these recycling entities that could potentially bring some of those chips back to the market. So um, if you take intellectual property cores as an example, um, there are, you know, the one we normally know is called synopsis of the world or, or ARM, et cetera. But the reality is that there's actually hundreds of different IP vendors distributed across the globe. And these IPs are designed in, in areas or outside of US that is considered by DOD as, as untrusted facility. Even those that are onshore, there are certain certificates, uh, certifications are required to make them to be um, um, a trusted facility to work at least with US government. And an IP can easily move from one location in, the, in one country to another location for various reasons, whether it's uh, um, DFT insertion to DFT insertion to physical design and, and then from their fabrication and so on and so forth. As, as, as the number of entities in the supply chain increases, one should expect that the security and trust issues will go up as well. So besides supply chain, another thing that I teach my students all the time is just the notion of what's sensitive, what's important, what's called asset, which is um, what is it that uh, we're trying to protect? At the end of the day, when you think about term security, security means protection of something that is secret. And if you, if you, if you, if you can protect it, then that system is no longer secure. When you think about your own home, if you, if you can't lock the door, then therefore your home is no longer secure. Um, and you can, you can take this notion and just apply it to pretty much everything. So when it comes to security, we're, we're always concerned about what's important, what's sensitive, and how to protect it. The challenge is that um, as more and more of our IPs go into the SOCs that today you should expect between 50 or sometimes 100 IPs actually show up in an SOC, a lot of also sensitive information is moving toward uh, inside the SOC. And as as those information is being all uh, placed in SOC and stored in SOC in some way or another, uh, SOC becomes a bigger target, right? And, and this could be applied very much the same way to the um, uh, advanced packaging and system in package that they're building. And those sensitive informations could be um, on chip or on device keys, uh, OCM keys, OEM keys, developer keys, device configurations, manufacturer firmware, um, all sorts of on device sensitive data random numbers, biometrics, if used, physical and columbal function, and so on and so forth. And the number of sensitive information, as I said, 
it's, it's increasing. So it's worth that we have to pay attention to that during our design process. So that besides power performance and area, we also take into account security as one of the important parameters. Attacks on hardware has been on the rise. And um, over the past 10, 15 years, we've seen numerous attacks has been reported, whether in form of uh, malicious implants that can be done either by third party IP vendors or untrusted foundry. Counterfeiting, I don't believe anyone needs really a lot of um, evidence for me to provide. There is so much counterfeiting out there. I mean, business of counterfeiting, we're talking about multi-billion dollar business that is that has been going on for years. Um, a lot of chips are counterfeited. I'm gonna elaborate more on that a lot of different ways. Physical attacks, unfortunately, are gaining a lot more momentum because they're becoming much more easier and more those instruments that used to be extremely expensive and inaccessible now are becoming accessible and uh, and unfortunately make uh, physical attacks maybe easier in some way compared to some other remote type of attacks because it gives you that physical access but um, it looks as expensive but it's becoming cheaper and cheaper especially as I said with devices becoming cheaper but also getting access to those devices in any lab here or anywhere in the world becoming easier. Side channel attacks, you can, you can look at EM, power, timing, et cetera, and be able to extract sensitive information, fault injection attack, to be able to cause either denial of service or cause fault to cause integrity or confidentiality violation. Reverse engineering to protect your IP, and the IP could be at the intellectual property core, the way we know it, or it could be system or system of systems, no matter what. Uh, there are many countries out there that they are interested in our IP. And the attack on hardware actually has a, has a different if, if effect in, on, on what, uh, when they show up in the news compared to what you get from you know, attacks on software. So the past four, five, seven minutes, six, seven minutes that I've been giving this presentation, every four seconds, we got a new malware introduced into the market. Nobody's shivering, nobody's screaming. But if this was a hardware attack, I can assure you everybody is scratching their head and the news is, uh, is all over the news and companies who are being impacted by that attack are losing tremendous amount of their, their, their value and reputation and stock because attack on hardware is extremely difficult to be fixed. Um, so if you look at what happened with the meltdown and spec ray, Intel on that day loses seven, eight percent of its stock value. What happened with Bloomberg story and that motherboard um, with Supermicro, Supermicro actually lost about 46% of its value and so on and so forth. So those are, those are really um, the impact that a hardware attack has on a company and its reputation where you know, don't necessarily get that uh, from a lot of software companies. This cartoonish example really just to give you some of the example attack that um, we are concerned about, um, malicious implants, malicious hardware, hardware Trojan, or whatever you call it, is a change in the circuitry. And the change can happen by an untrusted entity in the design um, uh, cycle, fabrication cycle, but it could be a third party IP doing this, it could be an, a rogue employee doing it, an insider or an untrusted foundry. And this cartoonish example, just to give you, to tell you that somebody could potentially inject an antenna that actually is monitoring sensitive information inside the circuit and takes that information and then uh, send it to the outside world. But this is really an example from many, uh, many, many scenarios of Trojans. And I'm thinking thousands and thousands of scenarios that one can actually create to be able to extract the sensitive information from the chip and send it out for an easy access by the attacker. And for those of us that work in this area of testing, we know that if this doesn't change the functionality, good luck testing it out, okay? And trying to figure out whether there is a change in the circuitry to detect it. So it makes it difficult to detect, easy to insert, and also provide easy access to the attacker where defender may not necessarily know exactly among these thousands of possibilities of malicious implants, which one basically came in. Counterfeit parts, I'm not gonna tell you which, which one of these five chips that you see here is counterfeit, just enough to tell you that there is a counterfeit chip here, you could see counterfeiters, how good a job they can do. Um, um, marking exactly the same. I don't see a difference. Somebody guessed there is a smallest scratch somewhere that, hey, this could be counterfeit. I would say that's just not good enough. 
it does require a really a rigorous test to actually figure that out if you did not design this chip with anti-counterfeiting in mind. But if you design them with some anti-counterfeit solutions, it become much easier to be able to, this, to, to see if the chip has been counterfeited or not. And when we talk about counterfeit, we're talking about different type of counterfeiting. We're looking at the chips that are recycled from um, scrap boards or some newer boards, but the chips are expensive. They're trying to reuse them. Remarked ICs that are actually remarked to the higher grade ICs from industrial grade to military, from military to space. I have stories to tell you about this sort of activities that have happened in the past. Overproduction where uh, foundry could potentially produce more chips than is intended. Out of spec and defective where foundry or assembly could potentially ship some of the parts that are not necessarily faulty, but they're not also well within the spec that is designed. The leakage is about a few percent more, and you know they should not be shipped, but they are, and so on and so forth. Cologne because of pirating either IP or reverse engineering that uh, somebody made clones. And I wrote an article about a couple of years ago, and I said clones are on the rise, and I think clones are on the rise because a lot of companies are able to reverse engineer chips now, especially older technology chips, which they still have a huge market, but um, they're easier to uh, reverse engineer, especially given the capabilities we have today in SEM machines and photon emission capability where reverse engineering become much easier. Recycling is really, really an easy process. Anybody could do it. You can do it. I could do it. Um, so um, then you can easily recycle chips, clean it up, put them back into the market and the margin it's extremely high. No wonder why recycling continues to be a major problem when it comes to counterfeiting activities. Reverse engineering at the PCB level. This is actually something we do in the lab. And I always say, if you do it, anybody can do it. I don't think it takes a genius to be able to reverse engineer a PCB. It, it does require a little bit of a trial and error and figuring how to work with X-ray machines. But once you figure it out, you would be able to reverse engineer a PCB like the way we did it, layer by layer, six, six layer PCB. You could see how we did it. And uh, semi non-destructive semi non in the sense that we don't even have to delayer these PCBs and uh, which we were able to get the entire um, schematic out, put the CAD file together and then go ahead and fabricate this again. Go ahead and fabricate as many as you want to and sell them into the market, right? And reverse engineering at the chip level, it's, um, it's um, basically requires you to do decapping, delayering. But as I mentioned, uh, the capabilities of um, SEM and FEP today is extremely good. Therefore, as a result of it, uh, these activities uh, happen offshore quite a bit as well. Just to give you a little bit also information about um, um, what you expect in terms of the, the security issues within the within the chip itself, there's actually quite few of those sort of vulnerabilities. Some of them I mentioned, side channel um, attack, uh, fault injection attack, um, information leakage, and, and so on and so forth. Information leakage is actually one of the biggest problem that we, we deal with when it comes to integrated circuits. Um, and there are many different ways designers that design the chip, even they um, have no intention of causing a problem. It's just that if the designer doesn't fully appreciate the security problems can easily cause those issues in, inside the circuit. A simple example of it is that, for example, if, if your, your um, uh, microprocessor is asking for a, a message to be encrypted so that it can go to the outside of the SOC, it does require the key to arrive at the encryption engine. The key can actually go through um, a shared bus before it gets to the encryption engine. If the shared bus is not protected during that uh, trans, uh, transferring of the key, another uh, entity that is not trusted could potentially be monitoring that, that uh, bus and be able to get access to the key, which basically your security credential is broken. This is really a simple example, but I assure you that even a simple example like this is found in SOCs that are designed. But the reality is, you take all of these um, um, different cores and interaction between them, you establish a set of policies and rules or um, you know, verification domain properties and develop right assertions to be able to check as many of them as possible to make sure that you cover them very well. Once you are able to understand that, uh, you know, what these attacks are and what the attackers wanted to do, then obviously required to put together a set of 
countermeasures uh, to be able to deal with these issues. The countermeasures come with the cost, depending on, again, what the cost is and what risk you're associated with, which with any of these uh, different type of attacks, it's some kind of a risk cost trade-off analysis may be needed to be able to decide which one of these attacks has to be addressed. And if the cost allows you to do more, you do more. Otherwise, you basically have to decide uh, what works best for your particular chip and particular target applications. And that could be different from another, 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 uh, another chip, another application. So this was a very quick overview of um, um, you know, some fundamentals of what the uh, hardware security is. And I'm going to go into the uh, second sections, but perhaps I can uh, take some questions before actually I move on to the um, next topic. Dave, is there any questions at your end? No questions submitted. If uh, anyone has a quick question, please enter it in the Q&A box. So I'll continue, but uh, happy to stop at any time. Um, so let's let's move on to advanced packaging. Um, um, I'll be the last person to tell um, about um, the the move towards heterogeneous integration and having having this functionally disaggregated hardware in form of a chiplet that come together that that form the system in package. And there are a lot of good reasons why this trend is happening. Um, one reason is the cost of building large SOCs using advanced technology nodes is becoming too expensive for many companies to be able to afford doing it. Yes, the Apple and Samsung and Intel and XM, Y and Z can do it, but we do have a lot of other companies that require those SOCs, but unfortunately the cost of doing that is extremely, extremely high. Um, if you look at some particular applications like server applications and server workload, demanding uh, quite a bit of uh, power, um, uh, throughput, et cetera, that, uh, that again is another reason. Um, slowing down of Moore's law would, uh, allows us to be able to go to 2.5D now, to 3D to be able to, to, to deal with some of those um, shortcomings. Um, having this catalog of chiplets that are fabricated in, in advanced technology nodes, but uh, given your volume, you can get them without you actually paying for the cost of fabrication, et cetera. Um, that, that is a big benefit as well. So that, that allows a lot of companies to be able to get access to the state of the art uh, uh, capabilities um, without necessarily them going through the costly process of design and fabrication themselves. So that's another important cha cha um, challenge that could be overcome by having chiplets available. So all in all, I think it brings in a lot of opportunities, um, a lot of flexibilities, um, cost reduction, re reuse of expensive IPs and chiplets, and so on and so forth. Those are all great. Uh, um, I've heard, I've, I've, I've watched a lot of um, uh, MEPTECH talks, and there's a lot of interesting talks talking about uh, automation, um, power issues, um, uh, performance area, etc. But we have to think about security before um, uh, shipping some of our parts into the market, knowing that now we have this um, aggregate of different parts coming together where we don't necessarily trust um, all of those parts. The multi-chip packaging or system package is not a new topic. Um, it's, it's, I guess, uh, it's just timing is right now to be able to, to, to move toward uh, 2.5D or 2D uh, integration. Otherwise, the topic has been around for many, many years. So you can go back to 1980s to hear about multi-chip modules. And then in 2000s and um, around that time, um, the notion of system in package, then 2.5D and 3D actually caught fire. A lot of, lot of work, a lot of research, a lot of companies started to build 3D ICs. Now, of course, this notion of heterogeneous packaging, we can bring, um, we can bring the uh, uh, different sets of uh, uh, parts, memory, uh, analog, mixed signal, digital, reconfigurable fabric, all together into one system, be able to connect them, and, and so on and so forth. Just to give you an example of uh, some of those efforts, for example, um, Intel has uh, a number of technologies to offer and same for other companies. 
um, Dave was asking me, uh, do I have a special relationship that because I'm an Intel endowed chair, then I show some Intel slides and, and I, I, I told them, no, this is actually because Intel folks that I work with, they were very kind to actually share some of this with me. Um, and uh, the, the slides really show the um, interposer technology that gives you high interconnect bandwidths that you can communicate between two dies near each other or dies between different, um, at different locations of the, of the SIP. Uh, Intel's EMIP technology got a lot of attention. It's an active, uh, basically, part that can fit between two dies or two chiplets, communicating, um, uh, enabling communication between the chiplets. But because it's also an active component, therefore, you can potentially place interesting security solutions to be able to enable monitoring um, not only the information that is being flown between the two uh, chiplet, but also attacks that could potentially happen. So I find EMIP technology very interesting. Um, and then of course the, the uh, 3D technologies from Intel, IBM and many other companies that have been developing this for, for quite some time. Similar to what we did in the embedded systems, we did a lot of uh, um, hardware software co-design when it comes to now um, SIP and system on package. We, we need to keep also this notion of chip package co-design where uh, when you're trying to build a system, you think about your specification, you identify certain number of chiplets that could come together. Some of those chiplets actually are the off the shelf. Some of them are um, 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 in-house chiplets that you fabricate and bring them all together. And the objective at the, at the beginning, uh, uh, everything I heard is basically the PPA, the power performance and area. Right. But once you start building this together, and then if if any anything that is considered to be untrusted that goes on the on the system and package could potentially cause all sorts of security violations, cause confidentiality violations, integrity violations, as well as potentially denial of service. So it's something that we have to keep that in mind as we as we do this notion, this this chip package co-design uh, process. So with that, um, with that, a very short background on, on, um, system, uh, on, on chiplet and system package, let's talk about um, the assumptions that we make when we do security analysis. Uh, one important assumption is that the chiplets that come our way, to be able to have them on a system in package, they may not be trusted. Some may be trusted and some may not be. I mean, I envision that it soon, you will, you, will, you will take a catalog from uh, DigiKey and you look at um, a, a list of chiplets that are offered. And these chiplets are offered by many, many companies that are distributed across the globe. And we don't necessarily trust every one of them. And um, whether it's used by, you know, in a commercial world or for government, establishing some level of trust for these chiplets is important. Um, the second thing is that even if you design your own chip and you're using as a chiplet within this SIP, um, that chip potentially is going to be fabricated in an untrusted foundry. Uh, how do you ensure that the untrusted foundry will not be able to manipulate your chip? You may use even untrusted uh, third-party IP. Um, looking at the structure of the chip, uh, the, the um, package, you're looking at a substrate layer, interposer layer, and the packaging itself, as of today, to the best of my knowledge, none of them are secure. The interposer layer comes from offshore. Substrate layer is happening on offshore. Packaging is happening offshore. The only thing that I think I found um, working with a lot of folks in this area, that there are some level of consensus uh, is that the integration and assembly faci facility, which we call them one, one entity really, uh, is assumed to be a trusted entity, whether it's Intel itself or i3 or Encore or a lot of other companies that they provide this capability, that's our assumption for now. Now, you could argue with me that I don't agree necessarily with some of this. To me, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter uh, whether you assume that something that I said on trusted is trusted, but some other things that I said trusted is not trusted. It does not matter. Why? Because it is still bring a number of untrusted entities and elements into the SIP, making overall this SIP to be an untrusted system, okay? So with that, let's take a, have a quick look at the very high level, 
of a supply chain for heterogeneous integration. Really, I divided them into three major categories or steps, right? One is what do you call them chiplet, but it's a complex process to get your chiplet, right? Because there's a lot of activities before the chiplet becomes a chiplet and become available to you, which I'm gonna get to that. Um, the second one is this notion of integration and assembly house that does this thing together and put, put this all together. And then of course it's shipped for packaging. Then it goes into the field. Then it goes to the end user and an end of life, right? And um, so if you look at each step, there are certain, certain assumptions we made in the previous slide. One is that this step is assumed to be trusted. If this step is untrusted, I, I would say, God help us, right? That, that there is nothing we can do. But we're assuming that we do have at least an entity that allows us to be able to integrate these pieces together, right? We assume that the chiplets that you're getting, um, uh, if it's not yours, and if you don't have a way to provide all the assurance necessary, these chiplets are untrusted, okay? They could come with all sorts of malicious entities, um, malicious implants. They could be uh, counterfeit. They could do all sorts of things. And when the chip also goes, in this package uh, goes into the uh, field, even though you may have some level of assurance that the package that you put together is trusted, but we assume that the field is untrusted which means that attacker in the field can get their hands on your system and then try to be anal to, to analyze it, understand how it works, understand what information are being flown and be able to cause all sorts of security violation. All right, this is again, no different from any chips that we built today. So there are two major uh, steps I consider then to be um, taken during this process. One is what I call a pre-integration security and trust verification where if you're using a chiplet to go into your SIP, you wanna make sure that you did something with this chiplet to have some level of confidence that the chiplets are going to be functioning correctly. And the second one is this uh, notion of design for secure integration, in a sense that uh, you now have tens of chiplets that you wanna put into an SIP. And these chiplets, no matter how much you try to verify their trustworthiness, you can never be 100% sure. So how do you put them together to make sure that they don't necessarily cause confidentiality and integrity violation? And I'm going to give an example. And design for life cycle assurance, which means that how do you design the system with life cycle in mind to make sure that during the lifetime of the system, the system is able to provide some level of security for itself, right? So if you're able to, if you're, if you're willing to pay for the cost of providing that security, I think the cost may not be high, but the gain, uh, but but the gain in, in terms of your reputation uh, could be uh, pretty valuable. Now let's take that uh, that supply chain and just dig deeper a little bit. If you look at a Mark, chip, the, quick, yeah, go ahead. forgive me for interrupting. There's a quick question, um, okay. and and I think it's pretty quickly answered. Any examples of insourced? And in the US OSAT assembly, I mean, it, I think the implication is maybe that everything is done offshore and yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah, so there, there are some, right? But again, I, um, I, I, I geared my presentation more toward what DOD consider as trusted and, and untrusted. But um, if, if within this equation that I create, if somebody says, well, uh, my OSAT, for example, is trusted, um, that's fine. We take that into account and then we eliminate some of the trust, some of the vulnerabilities that we think could potentially arise from an untrusted um, um, assembly and test facility that, um, that, 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 that will be removed from that equation, right? But it still, it doesn't change the fact that your chiplets that you're putting, you're, you're putting all together, that's untrusted. It doesn't change the fact that once the system goes into the field, it's untrusted. Anybody will be able to get their hands on the systems and be able to carry attacks. The more, of course, trusted entities involved, the less of those security concerns we have to worry about. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, sure. Um, so, um, if you look at the supply chain, and, and as I said, let's dig deeper. What you see is, is that, look, even those chiplets that we get, those chiplets could potentially be just one module or could be on an SOC of their own. And those chiplets could potentially have third party IP vendors or they can have some in-house IPs. 
um, that they all come together to build a chiplet. And the chiplet can go to a, a, a foundry X, which is untrusted to be fabricated. And then you go to chiplet two, and then chiplet two the same way. It could have some in-house IP, some third party IPs, goes to foundry two to be fabricated. And that foundry is supposed to be also untrusted. And at the end, you get these chiplets come your way, chiplet one, chiplet two. We assume that the chiplets are untrusted. And then those chiplets come in into a trusted facility and an interposer layer comes in, which comes from, again, at this point, offshore facility. Then we assemble them together. We send them for packaging and then post-packaging tests. We send them to the field and so on and so forth. So when we're talking about pre-integration trust verification, that's where we mean that you really have no control on the uh, design and fabrication of the chiplets. As I said, you just go to DigiKey and buy one, some chiplets. How do you establish the trust? This is really a difficult problem in this area. Design actually, is, to me, comparably, is much easier because it allows us to be able during integration, the period of time that we know that we can trust that process, to be able to bring some of the ideas to help us to be able to protect our, our system against a number of activities, right? So now, if based on what I just described, so let's put them all together and establish a threat model for each of these. The threat model for chiplet security and trust is that uh, somebody's IP may be attacked. If you're in-house IP, you're worried about IP piracy. If it's a third-party IP, you're worried about hardware trojan. So reverse engineering and piracy is important. If you're getting a chiplet, you need to make sure that the chiplet that is actually going to go into SIP is actually trusted, it's not cloned, it's not recycled, it's not out of spec, and so on and so forth. The second um, item that I mentioned is designed for secure integration. You can never be 100% sure that every chiplet that you have tested, they actually have 100% trust. So you need to make sure that you run a set of verification with policy, security policies in mind to be able to check whether there may be some suspicious activities happening. Even there is no success, suspicious activity, similar to building an SOC, when you put all of these different IPs together and information may be flowing from one IP to another, similarly, information can actually flow from, from a, a cache chiplet to a CPU chiplet to, a, to another, another uh, chiplet on the chip where unintentionally that information could potentially leak some sensitive information. And you want to make sure that you take, take that into account and at least find a way to check for that. And the third one is the design for life cycle assurance, which you want to make sure that now the system that is going to go into the field is going to have a secure operation throughout lifetime. It's going to protect itself against certain tampering, if that's important to you. It's going to have uh, supply chain integrity where it's able to enable traceability and provenance to be able to protect you against all production and out of a spec. If somebody wants to cause man in the middle, after all, we're looking at chiplets and chiplets are easily accessible. If somebody wants to cause man in the middle to be able to impersonate and then get access to your keys. You wanna make sure that you protect it and you wanna protect yourself from physical attacks if that is important to you as well. So let's take each of these threats and then let's talk about it. First is chiplet security and trust. So when you receive a chiplet and, um, uh, from, uh, from the market and you want to use this chiplet into your system, you really have a very limited ability to do, to, to, to establish uh, uh, security and trustworthiness. As I said, this is really a, a, a big problem in, this, in, the, in the hardware security domain. And there's, 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 there's some you could do to be able to um, gain confidence that the chip may not have a Trojan, but there's limitations. So for example, can I do logical verification? In other words, can I put my chiplet into the system and then I have this trusted chiplet that I build that I'm gonna communicate with various chiplets on, the, on, the, on this IP. And, and within this the system, I'm gonna capture those information, which is responses from, the, from those chiplets. And then I'm gonna call it a go, no go in terms of whether I can trust or not, right? But this is a really simple test. Can it help? Yes. But can it protect, for example, you from uh, a stilty Trojan? I would say unlikely, because if I'm designing a Trojan, I will make sure that those Trojans are not going to get activated very easily. And they're looking for certain conditions that, uh, that allows that particular Trojan could be activated. And it's very difficult for us to cover all of those 
corner conditions within the function of a circuit to be able to guess what might actually be considered to be a malicious, malicious implant. So it's difficult to do it. Additional things could be done like watermark, puff, et cetera, but they really just give you some level of confidence. You never be 100% sure. So you have to build your system from these untrusted chiplets, but in a trusted manner, right? So, but the second method that I mentioned is called physical verification versus logical verification. If you're talking about a, a, an attack scenario where foundry is untrusted and you actually do have somebody who is willing to provide their um, trusted GDS2 or layout, this technique actually could be very effective in providing the assurance that is needed. So let me elaborate. And I use them as a, a, a notion of verifier versus prover. So the way the system basically is going to work is that um, an OCM that design and their own chiplet, they're willing to work with a company that acts as a prover here. And even though the OCM doesn't trust the system integrator or verifier, and verifier doesn't trust the OCM, but they both agreed that they're going to be trusting the prover. And this way, the OCM uh, in, it makes sure that some of the sensitive information that may be captured by the prover, by getting access to the, for example, certain same images or GDS2 information, it's not going to be shared with the verifier or with any, any other entity. So what are those information? Well, OCM could potentially provide same images of the, of the chip that, it, that, that ensures that, hey, this is trusted. Or it could be certain test data. It could be certain challenge response information. And when, when verifier, in this case, the system integrator, a body um, of a chiplet and wants to use the chiplet within, or within the package, can, verifier also collects similar information and then hand it over to prover. The prover, by receiving that information first from OCM, is going to actually perform, uh, let's say, a, a, a develop a training model based on that information. And the training model could be based on the topology of the circuit, could be based on the images that obtained from the, from the chip, um, especially backside images, exactly, that's exactly what we did and then build a neural network based on that. And that keeps it as a secret. So now the verifier sends information and then prover try to use that information and then check and see if they match. And if they match, it gives a go no go back to the verifier. So that allows to be able to establish the sort of trust between the two. Yes, go ahead. Quick clarification question. OCM is offshore chip manufacturer? It's, it's an original component manufacturer. Thank you. Yes. Um, so just take it this as an example. Let's say a verifier in this case, a system developer is going to get chiplet A, B, C, D, and is going to take some images from those chiplets. Especially, as I said, we've done a lot of work on backside images, uh, backside of the chip, uh, and collect images from those. Those images go to a prover. Prover basically can give you a yes or no. Uh, in terms of whether it matches with, with what they actually have. Of course, this requires uh, chiplet companies to come in and be part of this um, um, effort, right? And you could ask me whether this does, does this make sense? Has this done before? And, and the answer is yes. Uh, what I'm proposing, it's really a vision that is not done today in our area, but it's done in the cybersecurity area. There's, a, there's the notion of uh, certificate authority, um, and that allows you to be able to establish trust between two untrusted entities. Mark, so, yes. who would play the role of prover? Wouldn't it be potentially a, a new threat as well? Um, it could be uh, similar again to other, other domain. It could be an entity that, um, that, there, that that entity's existence depends on the trust that establishes between untrusted entities. Can it be an EDA a company? Yes. Can it be just a new uh, small business company that is actually want to build something like this, which I expect this is going to happen? Yes. I do think that uh, something like this has to emerge when it comes to um, advanced packaging because of the nature of um, uh, chiplets. Yes. So is there a qualification procedure for this marriage? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, and, and again, qualification, uh, it's really that... Um, uh, some, some companies' revenue and reputation is very much dependent on being reputable and remain reputable. And again, this is, this is done in other domain, right? 
that 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 I am gonna my 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 business is going to function on the notion that I have to remain always trusted, right? But but this is obviously within within bringing members to this to this consortium that I'm that I'm talking about. But the reality is that. The whole thing can be done in a cloud environment and generation of the models and everything, these are all can be done basically automated. So you can take as many potential insiders out of the equation as possible. But keep in mind that this is really a vision and the details are gonna be that, that needs to be worked out, right? Did I answer your question, Dave? You did, thank you. So, um, so just going back to that physical verification. So we actually did that. I mean, uh, except the uh, prover part of it, assume that um, um, the, the, the collecting the images, analyzing those images and building models, et cetera, that's already done. That's, that's what we did over the past um, several years uh, by our team in, uh, in, in the Florida Institute for Cybersecurity Research. So it is doable, um, but it does require a, 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 a industry to come together and enable such a thing. So Mark, a few questions on that. Um, sure. Obviously this is a destructive process because yeah, you have to take it off the substrate, flip it over, that kind of thing. What, how much time and effort and cost is involved in this? That's an excellent question. Um, it is it is destructive um, because the, the the systems that we have still require a bit of a um, 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 uh, the, um, um, the delayering uh, the the substrate to be able to get close to the uh, transistors so we would be able to get the backside images so you have to do it for one chip for sure um, uh, in terms of the time that it takes uh, it depends on the size of the chip. For one centimeter where one centimeter died today, um, last time I checked, we were able to actually get uh, the entire process in place were somewhere around 30 hours. So it's still in, in, in tens of hours. That's reasonable. Can we, can we bring them down to, our goal was always to bring them down to less than 10 hours. Um, and that requires um, a lot more efficient image processing and uh, pattern recognitions and AI tools to come in and help us out. But it is possible to do that. Thank you. The second part of this uh, notion of secure integration really comes to the, the, the point in time that the chiplets have been some way tested, now they're ready to go into the, uh, into the package. And that's where there are some so much opportunities to be able to enable security moving forward, right? So we have been developing within Caspio Technologies, actually this, this, this concept called Acilla. And Acilla basically what it does is, it takes advantage of the integration opportunity by bringing an, an, an FPGA, an embedded FPGA as a chiplet to be part of the equation as well. It also offers uh, IPs for the chiplets that are willing to have this IP in them so that the security can be established between the FPGA and those chiplets. It's a very simple concept, but it actually provides tremendous amount of opportunities to be able to um, ensure security throughout life cycle. And that could help us with supply chain integrity to ensure we give an end-to-end -end traceability and provenance. It enables runtime monitoring to make sure that um, malware, ransomware, et cetera, I'm gonna explain that briefly, gonna be covered. It enables authentication as well as locking and unlocking of some of these chips. Uh, IP protection is very important. We expect that in the future, some of these chiplets are gonna be equipped with the uh, locking logic, uh, logic locking techniques. And um, it does require secure approach to unlocking each and every one of these chiplets because you don't want to just hand over the key in plain text from one entity to another. And the tamper detection, which means that if somebody is going to tamper the, uh, the system, then there is a capability that would be able to uh, capture the tampering that happened. And tampering can be done a lot of different ways, whether it's x-ray, clock glitch, voltage glitch, EM, laser, optical, Name it. There's a lot of different ways that one can actually perform tamping. So this gives you a high-level overview of what uh, Acela is. It's it it, it considers um, 
a, a small IP called CSEP, which is, stands for chiplet security IP to be placed in the chiplets. Not every chiplet company is gonna agree to that, but those that agree to have this chiplet, um, that, that to have this CSIP, uh, they would be able to come to, to work with the other entity that we're placing in the uh, chiplet FPGA called CHSM, which we call a chiplet hardware security module that controls the entire process of authentication, locking, unlocking, et cetera, inside the, inside the package. The CSEP actually is, has the capability to be able to unlock the, um, unlock the chip. It has some other capabilities like key sharing and session key generation, encryption, et cetera, I'm gonna elaborate. And HSM or CHSM has a lot of uh, interesting capabilities, which I'm gonna elaborate uh, as well. And this combination can actually allow us to be able to perform not only a good uh, secure integration, but also establish that lifecycle assurance that I was referring to. So let's, let's, let's have a closer look at these capabilities. The CHSM actually offers a lot of different functionalities, um, uh, symmetric encryption, asymmetric encryption, uh, one-time path, hash functions, true random number generator, physical and controllable function for key generation, uh, true random number generator for session key generation, odometer to be able to tell you um, uh, whether it's a, a boot odometer or life cycle odometer to tell you how many times the system under, undergoes certain boot operations or how long the chip has been used in the system, uh, watermark to be able to provide proof of authorship, tamper detection sensors to be able to tell you whether the system has ever been exposed to X-ray or clock glitch or, assist or voltage glitch or, or high temperature and so on and so forth. OTP memory, so it allows you to be able to store some of the secrets in the, into that memory. And power on controller, which is a, a, a unique uh, prim primitive developed by our team that allows you to be able to ensure that you can authenticate your system when it is fabricated in an untrusted facility. The second uh, IP that, uh, so that CHSM goes into the FPGA and then uh, CSIP is supposed to be in a standard IP that can go into every chiplet or every company that wanted to have this IP to be in their chiplet, right? And the benefit of doing it is that not only it is used to secure the chip itself, the chiplet itself, but it also enabled that secure communication with other chiplets as well as that embedded FPGA that contains the CHSM. Now that CSIP includes a physical and global function that allows you to be able to um, look at it in form of a username and password where username is electronic chip ID and password in this case is something that you extract from the, um, the, the physical variation of the chip that gives you some unique signature of the chip itself. It can have an odometer that can tell you how long the chip has been used in the field or the chiplet has been used in the field. It will have non-volatile memory so it can store some of the sensitive information that, uh, that is being used during the process. It will have a TRNG, a small TRNG to help uh, establish a secure uh, session key with other chiplets as well as CHSM. And then logic locking uh, interface because if they are equipped with the locked uh, logic locking so that that interface could be used to uh, unlock the chip as well. Mark, so how I, and I understand that this will uh, the encrypt the communication to and from the chip and, and that'll be a step up, but today, do we need to be concerned with uh, communications through the cloud without this in place? That's an excellent question. And, and the answer is, of course, we have to, but uh, in, this, in this presentation, my assumption is that anything that is communicated between the system and the cloud is trusted. Um, we actually have established a protocol that can enable the trust communication between your chip through an untrusted entity called tester or the software agents that are part of, or the proxies that are part of the tester, um, that that is still is enabled to establish the secure communication between the chip and the secure cloud. So, so that's already a solution we call them POCA, which is already in place. So your question is, is really important. That has to be taken for granted. That has to be in place. So that once that is placed, then you start focusing on the system itself and making sure that um, the communication between the IPs within the system is trusted as well. Thank you. 
So, so now let's go back to the supply chain and see how this all come together, right? Assuming that CSEP become a standard IP that, uh, that hopefully industry will develop this or something similar to that. So then CSEP now come in into the chiplets and that is part of every chiplet that goes into the integration. The FPGA um, I, it comes in in form of an embedded or a, 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 a FPGA chiplet and then the CHSM is going to go into a non-volatile memory that FPGA is going to be um, programmed every time the system is put up. And the CHSM basically is in a bitstream. Bitstream is protected, so it's proven that uh, this this works. So every time you bring it up, the FPGA is going to go is uh, is going to be programmed. And once that happens, then FPGA is going to bring up the entire system by establishing authentication and and uh, sharing key. And how does this work? So the first thing that FPGA will do is authenticate. The FPGA, in this case, CHSM, is gonna work with the chiplet CSIP to make sure that they know that this is chiplet X and chiplet X is what chiplet X should be. It's not another chiplet that somebody is impersonating that with the, to be able to communicate with CHSM so it can steal that sensitive information. It's a, it's, a, it's a handshaking process. It establishes a, a, a session key between CHSM and chiplet. Once the system is turned off, the session, C, session key goes away. Once you turn it on, the, the CHSM goes through the same process. It authenticates every one of the chiplets and it establishes a session key. And then from there, once the session key is established, it's gonna establish a, a, a it's gonna send the unlocking key from the CHSM to the chiplet so that every one of the chiplets can become unlocked and start to operating as intended, right? So I'm gonna skip some of the details here. So another functionality that comes from the CSIP and CHSM is what I just briefly answered uh, uh, Dave's question, which is um, once, a, once you have the CSIP into, into your system, every one of those chiplets could potentially communicate with a, a, an HSM within a foundry environment, which is now becoming pretty common. And the HSM communicate also directly with some kind of a secure cloud or, or, or AMI as an asset management infrastructure. And, and this enables you to be able to remotely control the test process so that you will not be able, you will not allow any, any sort of overproduction or defective parts or remarking of the parts, et cetera, to happen. And if you do the same thing with your SIP, CHSM will actually enable similar thing as well, which we would be able to securely communicate with the cloud and to make sure that each and every one of those packages are uniquely identified, authenticated, and generate a unique key and make sure that the number of packages tested and, um, and those that receive um, a go status, they really go to the market. And the ones that basically fail the test, they will never go back to the market. Again, some of the publications are listed and some of the recent publications, we've been working on this uh, for quite a while. The next interesting thing that CHSM is, is gonna enable is this notion of runtime integrity um, checking which means that CHSM actually within the FPG environment can actually monitor a lot of activities that happen inside the SIP between microprocessing units and memories, et cetera. And if a ransomware or malware ever to happen, the CHSM actually is able to monitor that and flag it. We have done both malware detection and ransomware, not necessarily in the context of um, a secure a, a, a system in package, rather having an FPGA on a PCB to monitor all the surrounding activities to be able to flag such a suspicious activities that's already done. So we're taking that experience that we have from that domain and bringing it into a heterogeneous integration. A couple of more slides to go. Um, CHSM actually enables uh, supply chain integrity. Um, going back to Dave's question, CHSM can communicate securely with a secure cloud. In fact, this was implemented by our team, and this is a communication with a blockchain infrastructure that would be able to uh, ensure that 
every part that goes into the uh, supply chain would be able to track when the part becomes a chip, the chip becomes part of a PCB, PCB becomes part of a system. At any step in the process, this capability that we developed would be able to generate a unique ID for the chip, unique ID for the PCB, unique ID for the system and system of systems, but also ensure that every part that goes into the PCB, if they're part of that assessment, they would be able to, authentic to be authenticated. When the PCB, in this case, let's say Bosch builds a PCB that goes into BMW. Once BMW receives that PCB, wanna make sure that that PCB or any other PCBs they receive, they are trusted then using this capability, they can communicate with the un, uh, unchip uh, HSMs and be able to ensure that every part that they have is trusted. Mark, yes. on, on that topic, there's obviously a, a strong hierarchy of information. You know, if you have a PCB with various chips, does the CHSM know the serial number of each one of those chips and only authenticate if the right chips are assembled together? How does that work? That's an excellent question. And the answer is yes. Um, I'm, I, I felt you just, uh, you just described my research topic area on this. Um, yeah, so the way we, we built this is that if you, if when, when the system communicate with the PCB, the uh, PCB's unique ID is gonna be extracted by the PCB when you bring up the PCB, right? And once that, uh, once that unique ID is generated, the unique ID is a representative of all the components that were part of this assessment or this, this uh, let's call it uh, challenge response protocol that we establish. So that ID actually is gonna tell you that this ID, if it is correct, that means every other chips that were on that PCB also were authentic PCB. And that information become, become your unique ID that you store into blockchain. And every time that PCB is evaluated, all you do, you ask for that ID from the PCB. PCB will generate that IP, right? And then it's gonna be uh, authenticated in the blockchain and go from there. Thank you. Uh, last item is this notion of physical assurance. Um, um, a team of researchers here uh, uh, at Fix Institute uh, work pretty much daily on, on this notion of physical attacks. And when it comes to building a system in package, when the chiplets are communicating with one another, um, you can't guarantee that all chiplets are going to be communicating in a secure manner. Um, there are certain chips that may not necessarily carry the security IPs that we just talked about. Therefore, some information may be carried in an untrusted fashion. And physical attack basically will expose them very easily because uh, you can actually see those interconnects. You could potentially probe into them and be able to read the information that is being transferred between the two entities. So the, um, the FPGA, the, M, the, the FPGA chiplet and the CHSM that we built actually can have this uh, sort of tamper detection sensors. And those tamper detection sensors should be able to protect you against a number of tampering uh, methodologies. So I'm not gonna go through all of it, but happy to discuss this at the end. Um, when I talked about physical assurance, the reason that our team is capable of um, doing this sort of attacks and assessments and developing countermeasures is because we do have such a, you know, great sets of capabilities here in the Fixed Research Institute that as of today, we can go down to one nanometer technologies, be able to fib into them, uh, take images. Uh, we do have photon emission capabilities, optical capabilities, um, microprobing and nanoprobing capabilities, uh, temperature cycling uh, capabilities, and so on and so forth. So as you can see some of them on, the, on this slide. This really enables us to be able to perform uh, a lot of interesting, interesting security uh, assessment on the systems that are built. So that was my last slide, and I'm happy to take some questions. Yeah, we're a little bit over, but I, there are two questions. One that comes to my mind with one which was posted, if you can hang for just a little bit. Um, the one is, what's the role basically of blockchain in all of this? Is that the only way to go or one of the ways to go? Or what's your thoughts about that? Yeah, uh, so blockchain uh, for us is meant to provide an ability to establish ledgers that the ledgers can tell 
um, uh, about the uh, or, or have information about a particular chip uh, or particular PCB or system or system of system that enable us to be able to within a consortium of companies that agree to be part of the blockchain that information to be shared. The information is not meant to be giving you information about the yield or anything like that that are sensitive, rather that um, the, the, the chip is authentic, that the company X actually purchased that chip and that chip went into a company Y to be part of their system or PCBs. And those PCBs went to another companies to be part of their systems, et cetera. So blockchain is, is already set up to do this. But it doesn't have to be blockchain. You can think of any secure cloud that you can store this sort of information and establish a search engine to be able to search and make sure you connect them all together, right? So there are different ways to do it, but blockchain just already has this capability that you can take advantage of. So coming from a, a test background, how do I test the security without violating it? Yeah, that's a, that's a difficult question to answer, to be honest. And the reason is because it's really, it's really, it really comes down to what's the threat model we're looking at. If I'm supposed to be testing security from a chip that I designed, it's very different than testing a chip for security that you didn't design, you don't know, you don't know all the internals of the chip, you don't know fabricated it. So think of a lot of commercial all off the shelf, right? That you you're kind of limited in what what you can do with that particular chip. So if you're testing a chip that you designed, uh, this is more like a white, uh, um, white hat type um, security assessment. You know everything about the chip. You can run certain um, security validations. You can throw at it some kind of a fuzzy test, penetration test. You can actually go and check some of your properties that you put in place. If you put some security solutions, you have access to them to be able to check and monitor them. So there's a lot you could do. The one that is the most difficult and the one that keeps me at night when I think about this problem is the commercial off the shelf components that the knowledge that you have from the chip is limited. Therefore, what you can do with regard to establishing security and testing for security is limited. And you have to throw pretty much anything you have at it. You have to perhaps try some uh, imaging techniques, at least on one chip to get some ideas about, you know, there are some, something that look different. You can try all sorts of functional tests, penetration tests, fuzzy tests, negative tests, et cetera, at it, to be able to look for some kind of anomalies that show up that you think that that could potentially be a security problem. But, it's limited. There is, there is really not a whole lot you can do when it comes to testing for security of commercial off-the-shelf components. And when you think about chiplet, that's exactly where I see the problem. When, for the chiplets that I design, I have a lot of good ideas about what I can do to verify them. But for the chiplets that I'm buying from the market, I'm very concerned about how to be able to test them. That's why I propose the notion of prover, because I do think that and the chiplet companies that they could be part of that consortium that are willing to work with the prover, um, they actually could gain bigger share of the market because then it allows individuals, uh, different companies to be able to work together with the prover to be able to verify the authenticity and trustworthiness of those chiplets, even though I may not necessarily share all my information with you and you're not gonna also provide your, your solutions or test the strategies uh, and share it with me. So Mark, as, as we switch slides, is there a industry initiative that you may want to refer people to for further discussion and uh, data? No, not, as, not that I'm aware of as of now. These are um, some of my vision and um, that I shared with the, with the folks on the call. Um, but given my past experience and what I've done in uh, microelectronic security, I am pretty confident that some of it somewhere or another has to come to reality when it comes to establishing security and trust. Thank you, Mark, so much for your, your time and efforts. So I just wanna remind everyone that two weeks from today will be the next speaker, next talk in our speaker series on this uh, machine learning AI and uh, topic. 
So please register through the, your MEP deck um, email that I'm sure will be coming out. And next week, very important, three-day uh, series of discussions on triplets, how to get there, how to test them, how to leverage the data, hopefully in a secure sense. <laughs> and I want to remind everyone that this material is, copy, is uh, covered under copyright from MEP Tech. Thank you for joining and uh, look forward to talking to you or seeing, talking to you next week or hearing from you next week.